I invite everyone to stand and turn toward the narthex. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Let us pray. Assist us mercifully with your help, O Lord God of our salvation, that we may enter with joy upon the contemplation of those mighty acts whereby you have given us life and immortality through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. When they are approaching Jerusalem at Bethpage in Bethany, near the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Just say this, The Lord needs it, and we'll send it back here immediately. They went away and found a colt tied near a door outside in the street. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, What are you doing untying the colt? They told them what Jesus had said, and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. And many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. And he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. The Lord be with you. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to praise you, Almighty God, for the acts of love by which you have redeemed us through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. On this day, he entered the holy city of Jerusalem in triumph and was proclaimed as King of Kings by those who spread their garments and branches of palm along his way. Let these branches be for us signs of his victory and grant that we who bear them in his name may evermore hail him as our King and follow him in the way that leads to eternal life, who lives and reigns in glory with you in the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Let us go forth in peace. Almighty God, whose most dear Son went up not to joy, but first suffered pain and entered not into glory before he was crucified, mercifully grant that we, walking in the way of the cross, may find it none other than the way of life and peace. Through Jesus our Lord. Amen. <laughs>
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty and ever living God, in your tender love for the human race, you sent your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, to take upon him our nature and to suffer death upon the cross, giving us the example of his great humility. Mercifully grant that we may walk in the way of his suffering and also share in his resurrection. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. A reading from the book of Isaiah. The Lord God has given me the tongue of a teacher, that I may know how to sustain the weary with a word. Morning by morning he wakens, wakens my ear to listen to those who are taught. The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not rebellious. I did not turn backward. I gave my back to those who struck me, and my cheeks to those who pulled out the beard. I did not hide my face from insult and spitting. The Lord God helps me, therefore I have not been disgraced. Therefore I have set my face like flint, and I know that I shall not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. Who will contend with me? Let us stand together. Who are my adversaries? Let them confront me. It is the Lord God who helps me, who will declare me guilty. The word of the Lord. Let us read responsibly. parts of Psalm 31 together. Have mercy on me, O Lord, for I am in trouble. For my life is wasted with grief and my years with sighing. My I have become a reproach to all my enemies and even to my neighbors, a dismay to those of my acquaintance. I am forgotten like a dead man, out of mind. For I have heard the whispering of the crowd, fear is all around. But as for me, I have trusted in you, O Lord. My times are in your hand. May your face to shine upon your servant. And your loving kindness the second reading is from Philippians, the second chapter. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. The word of the Lord.
may be seated. This is the passion of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. As soon as it was morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council. They bound Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate. Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? You say so. Have you no answer? See how many charges they bring against you. But Jesus made no further reply, so that Pilate was amazed. Now at the festival, he used to release a prisoner for them, anyone for whom they asked. Now a man named called Barabbas was in prison with the rebels who had committed murder during the insurrection. So the crowd came and began to ask Pilate to do for them according to his custom. Then he answered them, Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he realized that it was out of jealousy that the chief priests had handed him over. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have him release Barabbas for them instead. Pilate spoke to them again. Then what do you wish me to do with the man you call the king of the Jews? Crucify why, what evil has he done? So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released Barabbas for them. And after flogging Jesus, he handed him over to be crucified. Then the soldiers led him into the courtyard of the palace, that is, the governor's headquarters. And they called together the whole cohort and they clothed him in a purple cloak, and after twisting some thorns into a crown, they put it on him, and they began saluting him. They struck his head with a reed, spat upon him, and knelt down in homage to him. After mocking him, they stripped him of the purple cloak, and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him out to crucify him. They compelled a passerby who was coming in from the country to carry his cross. It was Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus. Then they brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of a skull. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him and divided his clothes among them, casting lots to decide what each should take. It was nine o'clock in the morning when they crucified him. The inscription of the charge against him read, the king of the Jews. And with him, they crucified two bandits, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by derided him, shaking their heads and saying, Aha, you who destroyed the temple and build it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests along with the scribes, were also mocking him among themselves and saying, Those who were crucified with him also taunted him. When it was noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. At three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, 
And someone ran, filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a stick, and gave it to him to drink, saying, Then Jesus gave a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, Oh Lord, you're here and we are here. May we be here together and may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O oh God, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. You may be seated. So I was reading an article recently and, um, uh, and I was really struck by this gentleman. He's a Franciscan. And his name is Richard Rohr. He uh, uh, runs the Center of Action and Contemplation in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And he has an interesting thing to say about our image of God. What is your image of God? What is God like for you? He says your image of God creates you. Or your image of God defeats you. There's an absolute connection between how you see God and how you see yourself and the whole universe. He said it's not a belief in God that sets us apart. It's the image of God in which we choose to believe that ultimately makes all the difference. For example, perhaps you have noticed that, have you ever noticed that those who believe in a God of wrath, let's say, are often some of the most angriest and wrathful people. Have you ever noticed that? Or, or those who believe in a God who is detached and indifferent are often some of the people that are almost so much indifferent and detached from the world around them. Or those who believe in a punitive, judgmental God, you know, the God is going to get them, right? Are often the most punitive and judgmental people. Or those who believe in a God of laws, right, often crumble in shame when they break one of those laws. Or, and most often, the most unbending and stern people imposing standards on others that they don't even keep for themselves. Roman Catholic nun Joan Chittister says, I've known all those gods in my own life. And they have all failed me. It is the God in whom we choose to believe that determines the rest of our life. For we become like the God we worship. So what is your image of God? Today is the doorway into Holy Week. The last few days of Jesus' earthly life. We call it Palm Sunday, Sunday of the Passion. And it's a week like, unlike any other week, right? It's a week that's filled with confusion and tension. We start with celebration. Uh, there's contradictions of both ecstasy and agony. It's a week that challenges, I think, if we allow it to, our perceptions of God. A week that makes us question, is this really God? Is this is what God is like? See, Jesus came into the world with this fierce love, this passion, right, of announcing God's kingdom. God's kingdom is not a place behind the clouds by the moon. God's kingdom is here. And now, and Jesus came proclaiming that God has drawn near to us, that God is near you, that God is with you, and that God is for you, and he's come for us to rescue us. And he's not against us, 
But this God is for us in a very real way. But the thing about this kingdom, about this reign of God, is that it challenges all our self-constructed kingdoms that we hold so dear. What are the kingdoms that you hold dear? What are those kingdoms that you hold so dear? Because I can assure you, whether you like it or not, or whether you like me saying this or not, Jesus, if you get near him, he'll challenge what you think about those kingdoms. And see, Jesus believed that God, man, was going to reign here on earth. And so he called all people who would listen to him to turn away from their former way of thinking and turn toward God and God's vision for the world. For God's vision, according to Jesus, was reordered around, are you ready for this? Mercy, kindness, justice for all people. Compassion, forgiveness, reconciliation, and love that destroys and tears down walls between people of all that God has created. And everything that Jesus did was about enacting and embodying this kingdom life, right? He healed people, he reconciled people, and he restored the hurting, the broken, the outcast, the God and neighbor. And he demonstrated in his very life, with his words, in his deeds, in his thoughts, God's favor, God's love, God's forgiveness, and God's acceptance poured out freely and completely for all people. And according to him, these are the things and the way that God values these are God's values. In Him, in Jesus, we see all that God intends, all that God wants, and all that God asks of us. You could say that in this Jesus, we actually see what God is like. And a countless people were drawn to Jesus as a result. Much like our 4th of July, Today, hundreds of thousands of Jews had gathered in Jerusalem to celebrate Passover. Passover was their emancipation from slavery in Egypt. And they gathered every year hundreds of thousands of people from all over the regions to celebrate that freedom that God had set them free. And Jesus is going to approach Jerusalem. But unlike the Roman emperor and his soldiers who, who dictated, right, by force and coercion and terror, these people ruled by exclusion and discrimination and prejudice and meanness and indifference and hate, Jesus enters Jerusalem riding a donkey, a colt. Now, this donkey to the people that had gathered, they knew what that was. It was a symbol of peace, and it also fulfilled a prophecy that had gone back 500 years. That the Messiah would be on a donkey, the Savior. And Jesus came in on that donkey, and he had one weapon with him. Do you know what Jesus' weapon was? Jesus' weapon against all the power, all the dominant forces of his day, the one weapon that Jesus brought into Jerusalem that day was self-sacrificial love. He actually believed Think about this, how crazy that is, that he believed that self-sacrificial love would overcome all power and all corruption in the world. And that self-sacrificial love would be the weapon, if you will, that set people free. And see, when the crowd went crazy, they went wild when Jesus drew near. Right? I mean, this was a moment that they had been waiting for for hundreds of years. 
And at last, their dreams were getting ready to come true. Because a nation that was constrained under the oppression of the Roman Empire was going to be set free. And Jesus was the one that's going to do it. And so they shout, Hosanna, which means save us now. They praised God for all the powerful deeds they had seen in Jesus. And they proclaimed that he is the one, he's the messianic king. The one who would lead a war of freedom against the Roman Empire. They were excited. But here's the crazy thing. Just in amount a week's time, week's end, things go horribly wrong. And it seems to be because Jesus doesn't give them what they want. Jesus doesn't give them what they expect. And Jesus challenges their very perceptions of the meaning of life, their values, their ideas of power, their ideas of winning, their ideas of comfort, their ideas of stability. See, these people wanted Jesus. Oh, I want me some Jesus, right? I want me some Jesus. They wanted salvation. That is, they wanted to be set free. But here's the thing. They wanted it on their terms. They wanted it the way that they think it should be done. They don't want a God. They don't want a Messiah. They don't want a Savior who changes them by challenging them and their views of themselves, challenging them about their views of their neighbors or even their own values. They want a Savior who's going to reinforce what they think. A a Savior that will validate their beliefs and their values. In other words, Jesus, save us. Woohoo! Save me, Jesus. But whatever you do, don't change me. And here's the truth. People still want that same Jesus today. And 2,000 years later, people still miss Jesus for the very same reason those people did 2,000 years ago. And guess what they do? When Jesus fails to live up to my expectations, and Jesus is not doing things the way I think Jesus needs to be doing them, right? And Jesus, right, we turn against him, right? And so that's what they did. They turned against him. He's handed over to his enemies. He's handed over. And so they betray him, right? They arrest him. Y'all ever heard this story before? <laughs> and, and, and they cry for his execution. They beat him like a dog. They crown him with thorns. They mock him. They spit on him. They beat him. They laugh at him. They strip him. And then they nail him naked to a cross where he dies. Isaiah says, by his wounds we are healed. And see, this week proclaims that in Jesus Christ, God offers absolutely everything that God is, his heart, his soul, his being, his body, his life, to make a complete and supreme sacrifice. And in his body, we claim, this story claims, that in him, he absorbs all the human sin, everything that's broken, everything that's wrong, everything that hurts, everything that destroys the image of God in God's creation. And ultimately, he takes death into himself. Why? Well, according to him, that is to save you, to rescue you, to make you whole, to take all that is lost, all that is broken, all that is sinful, all that is beyond repair in this world, in your life, in my life, and all of those who think they've already been repaired. 
and to reconcile us, restore us, heal us, and bring us back to God. Jesus, believe it or not, demonstrated that we are worth living for. He believed that we were worth living for, that God so loves you with all that God is, that everything in God's being loves you. He thinks you're worth it. But here's the crazy thing about this God. He also loves you so much that he thinks you're willing, that you're worthy of dying for. What kind of God is that? And in his act of vulnerability, in his power to love, he ultimately restores and reconciles the world to God. What is your image of God? What kind of Savior are you looking for? This story this week claims that the one on the cross is God. Broken, beaten, suffering, the one who enters fully and offers everything of himself as a sacrifice so that he can be with us and for us. What kind of God do you believe in? What's your image of God? Is he the one who offers you everything you want instead of what you need? Because this God that hangs on a cross is the one who offers you everything you need instead of everything you want. For the past several weeks, we have explored this Lenten series called The Way of Love. We've looked at a set of practices, um, a structure, right, that will lead us into a deeper, richer, more meaningful life experience with Jesus. And we've looked each week of a certain set of practices. First week was turn, right? Turn toward God. That was Jesus' first thing that he ever said was turn. Hey, the kingdom of God is here and now. It's coming. It's near you. It's among you. It's with you. It's in you. Turn. And so we talk about turn. Learn, right? Learn about this God. Pray, worship, bless. That's pretty amazing. You know, I've done all those things in my life, you know. I can turn toward God. I can turn toward Jesus. I can learn about Jesus and God. I can pray. I can worship. I can even go out and bless people. But this week is different. This week, we are actually challenged to go, to go with Jesus, to find ourselves in the story between the palm branches and the cross. For this is not a story that we're here to explain so that we can understand it better. The story of this God the one who comes for us, who enters our world, the one who enters into our suffering, our sin, our death, the brokenness, the darkness, the ugliness of everything that is, is a story to be embodied and a story to be lived. And so in his passion, Jesus waits for our response. What kind of God do you believe in? And he asks us, will you follow me or will you deny me? Will you trust me or will you betray me? Will you embrace me or will you reject me? Will you go with the crowd or will you go with me? What God do you believe in? Who's your image of God? Amen.
I invite you into a moment of silence. Let us pray for Christ's church and the world. Creator God, by the mercies of your Son, our Lord Jesus, compel us to turn our hearts to his way of love that we might follow Jesus together as your faithful people. We pray together. Jesus, your life, death, resurrection, and ascension inspire the church to continue in the apostles' teaching and fellowship. Guide your people to learn your word that we might see God's story unfolding in our midst. We pray together. Son of God, you responded to your Father in prayer and pleaded that we might all be one. Guide the leaders and faithful citizens of this nation to respond to God and to, the, and to one another in compassion in thought and deed, with or without words, that the people of your world might live in unity and peace. We pray together. Jesus, guide us in your way. Light of the world, you taught us to worship in spirit and in truth. Lead us to join with others to acknowledge the holiness of God, that the whole world might be united in the truth of your love. We pray together. Jesus, guide us in your way. Lord, you came not to be served, but to serve. Empower us to bless one another and our neighbors that your spirit of generosity, compassion, and selfless action transform us and the people in our midst. We pray together. Jesus, guide us in your way. Savior, you came into our midst that we might know life. Embolden us to go among those who are weary, burdened, sick, or imprisoned. We especially pray for Bob, Bruce, Cynthia, Emily, Esmeralda, Esther, George, Grayson, Julian, Margarita, Mary T., Michael, Naomi, Noel, Sean, Susie, Tansia, that we Tramel, might, sorry, sorry. Tramel, Warren, Whitney, and the Morales family. That we might live like you, crossing the boundaries that divide rich from poor, sick from well, and sinner from saint. We pray together. Jesus, guide us in your way. Lamb of God. In your death, you destroyed death and taught us the way to eternal life. Compel us to daily die to self and rest in your grace. May all who have died rest in peace and rise in glory. We pray together. Lord Jesus Christ, who gave your life for the life of all. 
we commit our lives to following you. Continually guide us in your way and draw us into life as your beloved community in this age and in the age to come. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Good morning, everyone. You perfect. So I have a question for you before we start waving these around. Who's ever been to uh, a parade before? Has everybody been to? You've been to parade, parade, parade. What kind of parades have you been to? Disney. Oh yeah, Disney has a parade all the time, like every night. You look thrilled about the parade you went to. You forget, so it wasn't that much of an impact, didn't have much of an impact. A lot of parades. What parade did you go to, Phoebe? The Disney parade. So what do we do at parades? What happens at parades? Party. party. Say that again? Celebrate, party. You said we are going to say something, but now I'm looking at you, so you're probably not going to say it. We'll come back to you. What do we do at parades? We party, we celebrate. We have fun. This is great. I like parades. We give out treats. <laughs> Parading. Okay, We're, there's, a, there's movement. We're going somewhere, right? The party is on the move. What, uh, what parade do we celebrate today? Does anybody know? Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday. That, that was a parade. There's who? Ever seen a parade where there's floats? Well, Palm Sunday was a very, very important parade that we reenact and we re -re parade today. It's a parade that, yes, it was the first century version of a float. Jesus was riding a donkey and he was, and he was throwing candy out everywhere, passing out treats. And all the people were on the aisles of the street and they were waving their palm branches and throwing them down and taking their jackets off and throwing it on the floor. I don't know why. And so the donkey's feet wouldn't get dirty, right? Hurt. And they were, what were they saying to Jesus as Jesus was coming down? I don't know. Thank you for the candy is what they were saying. No, they were saying, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. So you know what they believe? that Jesus was parading into the city of Jerusalem to beat up the bad guys, the Roman Empire that stole the Jewish people's land. They thought Jesus was going to go in and become king and beat everybody up. But is that what he did? He, sh he should have done that. He had every right to do that. But how did Jesus save them? How did Jesus save the day? What did he do that was different? He came and died for us so that we can be with him forever. So Jesus went into the city of Jerusalem not to beat up the bad guys because he actually loved the bad guys. And he didn't save people. You believe that or not? It's crazy. This Jesus guy, he was an interesting guy. He didn't save people by hurting them or by hating them or using force, but he saved people by loving us. That's what Jesus did on this day that we celebrate. Amen? Amen. Wiggle fingers. Thank you, Jesus, for riding your float and passing out candy on the way to Jerusalem and dying for us.
in love for us so that we can be with you now and forever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, everybody. Good job. Yay. Yay. Somebody left their uh, tiff. Thank you. So any birthdays or anniversaries being celebrated this week? If so, birthday, birthday. All right, we got one, two. All right, let's pray. Well, God, our time's in your hand. Look with favor, we pray, on your servants as they begin another year. Grant that they may grow in wisdom and grace and strengthen their trust in your goodness all the days of their lives. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Happy birthday. Blessings. Okay, just wanted to remind you, there are numerous announcements in this bulletin. I'm going to ask you to please read those. Uh, also, uh, as we enter into Holy Week this, um, this week, um, did I tell you all it's Holy Week this week? All right, good. So just remember that we have a Monday, Thursday service at 6.30 on Thursday evening. We have a Good Friday service at noon on Friday. And then we have on Sunday, which is Resurrection Easter Sunday, uh, we have two services at 7.45 and at 10.15. And I hope that you're able to enter in and, 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 and participate in this week. One of the things I would encourage you to do is um, through some form of devotion, Lenten reflections, or maybe our Lenten guide, is to continue to read those stories each day. Think about what these stories are saying to you in your life and how God has come for us. And hopefully, as we enter in and get through and, uh, on Easter, that uh, Resurrection Sunday will even be more, more beautiful and meaningful to you. So I hope you'll join us. Michael? Good morning. Good morning. So as I was walking in this morning, I got uh, a couple uh, different reactions. One was, I, I love your t-shirt, and the other one was, <gasps> oh, shock, shock that I would wear a t-shirt to church. I did it for two very important reasons. One was so that Father Rick would see me standing over there uh, and remember to invite me up. And two was because it is from an event that is very important to me. Um, this year is the sixth year that St. Michael's will be participating in Pause for Peace, which is an event that is um, to benefit the kennel at Harbor House. Um, Harbor House is one of the only uh, domestic violence shelters in the southeast that has a kennel. Um, and there are two important reasons for that. One is that 60% of domestic abuse survivors will delay leaving their situation if they believe their pet will be harmed. And that is not an unfounded fear because 88% of pets that are left in a situation like that are injured or killed by the abuser. Um, this provides people and their pets a safe place to go. And this will be the sixth year that St. Michael's is participating in this event. Um, it is a great example of St. Michael's getting outside the four walls of this church and being a force for good in the community. Um, so I would encourage you, I'll have a table back by the um, coffee hour, come and get some coffee, a donut, talk to me about it. It's going to happen on uh, April 27th, there's information in your bulletin, and I hope that we'll see you there. Thanks. Thank you, Mike. I just wanted to remind you that after our uh, Monday, Thursday service, around 8 o'clock, we'll begin our vigil, um, the watch, uh, that will be in, in, in our chapel. Uh, there's a sign-up sheet out in the narthex, and that's an invitation to anyone throughout the entire night from 8 a.m. till early morning. You can sign up for an hour or whatever you want and come and pray and watch. And so we invite you to do that. Just wanted to remind those who are just visiting uh, that you're welcome here. We're so grateful that you're here. One of our core philosophies um, is that we accept you wherever you are on your journey. And we trust that um, God will take you where God wants you in God's timing. Just want to be a place, hopefully, that welcomes you and you can experience and, um, the love of God. 
Anything that I'm forgetting. It seems like there's something I'm forgetting. I did that already. Where were you? You were thinking about your sermon for the kids. That's what it was. All right. Well, as I said, every week, but we see it this week especially, and that is this love, right? Um, that we are indeed loved with a love we didn't earn, and it's a love we can never lose, and that's the love of God for us in Jesus Christ. It's all given. It's all gift. Our only response is to open our hearts to that love and say yes to that love and to walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us an offering and sacrifice to God.
The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. God of all power, ruler of the universe, you are worthy of glory and praise. At your command, all things came to be the vast expanse of interstellar space, galaxies, suns, the planets in their courses, and this fragile earth, our island home. From the primal elements you brought forth the human race and blessed us with memory, reason, and skill. You made us the rulers of creation. But we turned against you and betrayed your trust, and we turned against one another. Again and again you called us to return. Through prophets and sages you revealed your righteous law, and in the fullness of time you sent your only Son, born of a woman, to fulfill your law, to open for us the way of freedom and peace. And therefore we praise you, joining with the heavenly chorus, with prophets, apostles, and martyrs, and with all those in every generation who have looked to you in hope, to proclaim with them your glory in their unending hymn. And so, Father, we who have been redeemed by him and made a new people by water and the Spirit now bring before you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be the body and blood of Jesus Christ, our Lord. On the night he was betrayed, he took bread, said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his friends and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, gave thanks, and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering now his work of redemption and offering to you this sacrifice of thanksgiving. Lord God of our fathers, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, open our eyes to see your hand at work in the world about us. Deliver us from the presumption of coming to this table for solace only and not for strength. For pardon only and not for renewal, let the grace of this holy communion make us one body, one spirit in Christ, that we may worthily serve the world in his name. Accept these prayers and praises, Father, through Jesus Christ, our great high priest, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit, your church gives honor, glory, and worship from generation to generation. Amen. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, 
who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The gifts of God for the people of God, take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven, the blood of Christ, the cup of salvation.
Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. May God bless you with discomfort at easy answers, half-truths, and superficial relationships so that you may live deep within your heart. May God bless you with anger at injustice, oppression, and the exploitation of people so that you may work for justice, freedom, and peace. May God bless you with tears to shed for those who suffer pain, rejection, hunger, and war so that you may reach out your hand to comfort them and to turn their pain to joy. And may God bless you with enough foolishness to believe that you can make a difference in the world so that you can do what others claim cannot be done. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Let us go forth in the name of Christ.